Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Ine Prakash. I am a programmer at Maisel's Documentary Center. Uh, our physical location is in Harlem. Um, we have a 50 seat theater there that we love very dearly and we wish we were in. Of course, um, such are the circumstances. Um, we're happy to be able to find alternatives. Um, we are here today uh, to uh, host a panel around a series we're doing called Le Jolie Maisels. Uh, Le Jolie Maisels is a celebration of the beautiful month of May at Maisel Cinema. This series uh, summons its name from Chris Marker and Pierre Lone's Le Jolie May uh, from 1963, a portrait of Paris just after the ceasefire between France and Algeria. This documentary with its on the street interview and reflections on happiness itself harkens back to Chronicle of a Summer from 1961 in which Jean Rouge and Edgar Morin took to the streets of Paris to ask people the blunt and sometimes confrontational question, are you happy? Um, the films capture the truths and fictions generated between filmmaker and subject and situate personal well-being within a larger web of political struggle and collective consciousness. The series looks at the lineages of those films in a, um, and uh, the filmmakers here connect with the lives of individuals within their complex social, political, and economic environments. They take a hard and thoughtful look at the present moment, actual people and their collective memories, anxieties, and desires while gesturing towards an endlessly uncertain future. And I'm very um, honored today that we have here uh, Mark Street, Brett Story, and Gordon Quinn. Um, I'll introduce them one by one. So uh, Gordon Quinn is artistic director and founding member of Artem Quinn Films. He's been making documentaries for over 50 years. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times called his first film Home for Life an extraordinarily moving documentary. With Home for Life, Gordon established the direction he would take for the next four decades, making cinema verite films that investigate and critique society by documenting the unfolding lives of real people. Other films Gordon have, has made include Vietnam, Long Time Coming, uh, Golub, Five Girls, Refrigerator Mothers, and Stevie. Gordon has won numerous awards throughout his career, including three Emmy Awards, and uh, it feels pertinent to note that he was honored by the 2016 St. Louis International Film Festival's Maisel's Brother uh, with the Maisel's Brother's Lifetime Achievement Award in documentary. Thank you so much uh, for being with us, Gordon. Great, glad uh, to be here. And then um, Brett Story is a geographer and award-winning nonfiction filmmaker. Her films have screened at True False, Oberhausen, Hot Docs, the VNL, and Doc Leipzig, among other international festivals. Um, her second length feature film, uh, previous to Hottest August, is The Prison in 12 Landscapes and was awarded the Special Jury Prize at Hot Docs uh, and was a nominee for Best Canadian Feature Documentary at the Canadian Screen Awards. Her interests across the fields of documentary and critical theory are expansive and include experimental cinema and essay films, politics and aesthetics, radical capitalism, uh, racial capitalism, and Marxist political economy and visual geography. Uh, Brett holds a PhD in geography from the University of Toronto and is the author of the book Prison Land Mapping Carceral Power Across Neoliberal America from the University of Minnesota Press. She was a 2016 Sundance Art of Nonfiction Fellow and is a 2018 Guggenheim Fellow. Um, thank you so much, Brett, for joining us. Really glad to be here. I can't hear you. Mark Street graduated from Bard College and the San Francisco Art Institute. He's shown work in the New York Museum of Modern Art Cineprobe series at Anthology Film Archives, Millennium, um, San Francisco Cinematheque. Among others, his work has appeared at, the Tri at Tribeca, Sundance, Rotterdam, New York, London, San Francisco, the New York Underground Film Festival, Sarajevo, Viennal, Our Sense, Mill Valley, and South by Southwest. He is assistant professor of film in the visual art department at Fordham University Lincoln Center, where he teaches film video production and other courses that engage contemporary artistic practice. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Thank you, nice to be here. Um, you're three of my absolute heroes, so this is a, a real treat for me. And uh, I should reiterate also that the films you're representing in the series, uh, Mark has a new film called Work Songs, as well as a short from years ago called Happy. Uh, Brett's new film is called The Hottest August. And uh, the film we have by Gordon is called Inquiring Nuns, which was made in 1968. Um, I should say, uh, so my first year in film school in Chicago, uh, inquiring nuns was the first thing they showed us and then they sent us off on the streets uh, to do our own version of it. 
Um, how uh, how did you? So had you had you heard of Chronicle? You'd seen Chronicle of a Summer and yeah. perhaps Luke Bruni. Yeah, we had we had seen Chronicle of a Summer, uh, and actually I was still a student at the University of Chicago when I saw Chronicle of a Summer, uh, but we were very excited by it. And and Jerry Temner, who I found at Cartemplin with, and I both, when we had the opportunity, we were doing a series of films uh, for Catholic adult education, and we kept talking them into the things that we thought we wanted to do, and so we were like, how can we do something like that. Uh, and it was like, oh, we'll do it with nuns. They'll go for that. And so, you know, we pitched them the idea and we, we were supposed to be doing uh, six short films to stimulate discussions in church basements. And they wound up with all these feature length documentaries. We did a whole, a whole series for them. So that's kind of how it came about. And it was an incredibly easy film uh, to make. We shot for eight days and the editing was, uh, that was when I was still editing. Uh, it just sort of fell together naturally. Uh, and you're not the only one who was in a class where they sort of tried to replicate it. Uh, some high school students did it. It's actually an extra on the DVD. So I've, I've heard about that. Oh, that's wonderful. Um... And I'm sure that's something you enjoy as well, seeing seeing the work have such a long life. Yeah, and and a few years later, I did see La Joe and I, uh, I can't remember where, probably at, maybe at the Cisco Film Center, uh, which was, that was before it was, the, it was just the Film Center uh, at that time. Uh, and was incredibly impressed with that too. And later when Steve James wandered into Cartemplin, it was one of the things that we had in common, which was a love for this film. Um, that's wonderful. Yeah, I um, the Cisco is where I, I did most of my film watching in Chicago. Yeah. Um, and one 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 detail, uh, one Maisel. I I knew Albert back in the '60s, and I actually bought my very first lens for Home for Life because we were trying to emulate what they were doing with the. We had the second crystal control camera in Chicago. The first one was brought back by somebody that I worked for, Mike Shea was a Leacock Penny Baker, you know, built by that guy, Beck Donich. And we built our own version with a friend of mine who was a physicist at the U of C for, you know, we, we had a general camera conversion and we made it crystal controlled for a few hundred dollars where they were, their camera was $20,000. And I needed a lens with a short finder and they, they just didn't exist. And Albert was, had a lens that he sold me. Oh, that's extraordinary. Did you know each other already just through the profession? I, I wasn't really, I was, wasn't in the, I was just starting, you know, but I knew who he was. I don't remember if I'd met him before I bought the lens or not, but I remember going to New York to get this lens from him. That's great. Um, Brett, I saw uh, Hottest August for the first time at Hot Docs like about a year ago now. Um, and it completely floored me. I was so um, excited by it, um, you know, its freshness and also the way it embodies this this history. Um, how what was uh, what was the journey for you? From um, were those films inspirations, and, and how did Hottest August come about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I like you know everyone here. Um, I'm just such a huge fan of La Jolie May. I saw it, it was one of the later Chris Marker films that I saw, and I think I saw it actually when it was, re, it was reissued a few years ago. Um, so I think I saw it in a theater. And, um, you know, I have, I, I'm already an admirer of a, a particular way of approaching political filmmaking that um, Chris Marker um, embodies. And with this film especially, like there was just this really, for me anyways, like the the way in which it takes it takes so long to realize you're watching this indictment of French colonialism. Like you're just sort of like in this film that's like meandering with ordinary people talking about all sorts of things. Uh, which, and that, that seeming sort of like, you know, di set of digressions doesn't take away from how enjoyable and deliberate it feels but then the sucker punch of realizing that this is like a real examination of of um colonialism and um 
and complex complicity with violence was just it was all, has stayed with me for a really long time and i also just i've always been interested in interviewing as a mode i feel like there's ways in which interviews get kind of a bad rep um people talk i know a lot of my students talk about talking head films with derision it's like a bad thing yeah. um, but i think what people say is really interesting like you know, uh, and watching, you know, Mark Mark and Gordon's films, you know, had the same sort of pleasure in just like listening to how people respond when they're asked questions about their lives. So yeah, I always admired that film for its sort of like way of, uh, of exploration. And then I, in my own sort of world have been like many people just pondering the question of futurity, thinking a lot about how, what it's like to live with the climate crises and how we, um, how we negotiate that, not just as, a, as an issue, but as a sort of like way of being. And was thinking about a, a way of making a film that would allow me to explore how we live with the new reality of a kind of growing futurelessness. Um, and so, yeah, I think when I was thinking about Le Jolie May as a model for, for the hottest August, I was thinking a lot about how I wanted to make a film about the climate crises that kind of was composed of a set of digressions where I just, you know, used the excuse of a, of a place and a month and conversations with strangers to sort of find out what, what it's like to live in this particular moment with this particular um, generalized crises becoming part of our just everyday fabric. Extraordinary. Um, Mark, uh, did you have a, do you, have you had a similarly long relationship with the films? Yeah, I saw um, Le Jolie May in college um, and, and I, I um, you know, I second both what Gordon and Brett said about um, an immediate appreciation. And um, I think Brett used the word meandering. And I, I just, I find the, the journey of that film and then of course the journey of uh, Chronicle of a Summer, uh, which I saw later, um, you know, it's accumulative in a way that I really admire. It's, it's these little weird seeming cul-de-sacs that end up um, aggregating and, um, you know, leading us somewhere as as we're watching it in a way that that I really admire, so um, you know Brett was talking about the interview, um, and I I too both in Happy and in Work Songs really felt like conversation was a central tenet of it, and um, I think Foucault makes a distinction between an interview and a conversation. Um, a conversation being less hegemonic or it sort of blunts the authority of the, of the interviewer. And, um, you know, I just wanted to, both of these films to aggregate around talking to people, being surprised by them, having them maybe turn the tables at times, uh, take me in directions I hadn't anticipated. And um, I think it's the spirit of both of those, those films that guided me. I didn't look at them before I set out to make this. They're always in the back of my mind. What if they could... What if they could digress? What if they could wander? What if they could take somewhere, the, the viewer somewhere, and she didn't know where she was going there, and then it all became clear, you know, after, after the film was over, something like that. Thanks, yeah, absolutely. I feel uh, all three films really um, emphasize the strength of what you can get out of a simple interview. Um, Brett, since you mentioned um, the political aspect, I, I'd like to go there um, right now. In both um, of in these films, there's, like you said, it's looming in the background, but it becomes apparent over the course of the film um, that it's looming very heavily and it's on most people's minds and most people have an opinion about uh, what's happening um, in, in the case of France with Algeria. Um, in your film, the election had just happened and although that's not um, dealt with Explicitly, I'm sure you were thinking about it. And of course, um, you know, when you're talking about the future, I'm sure you assume climate change would come to people's uh, minds. Is that, um, and I think most explicitly too, you inherit that, that political tradition. I, part of the text narration is from Karl Marx's Capital, which is pretty awesome, I think. So were you, um, was, that, was that a big part of it for you going in? 
Uh, I mean, certainly. I mean, it's what it just in the sense that it's what I think about. I think a lot about structures of power, economic systems, living with violence. Um, but I think as a sort of mode of filmmaking and a kind of film that I'm interested in, I'm I'm less interested in in making a film that just like says what I think politically about the world, and I'm I'm more interested in exploring the the real. Um, complexity with which people like negotiate um, having to live in the world, right? And so, um, you know, what was so my sort of thesis going into the film was that like, we live with a lot of anxiety, but we do different things with our anxiety. So what happens when I ask people, you know, not directly, do you, are you know, uh, do you believe in climate change? Are you worried about it? But rather like, what are you thinking about? What are you What are you worried about? What do you think is going to happen tomorrow? Um, because I do think that um, I think like I'm I'm really interested in questions of of power, but especially you know what people do with their with their anxieties when they have different degrees of power, or they feel or interpret their their sense of power in different ways. And um, it's really it was really interesting to encounter, you know. On the one hand, sure, people have, have a tremendous set of worries about the world, but they were also very quick in my conversations to kind of express a, some version of, of a kind of optimism. Things will be fine tomorrow because X or because Y. And I think that that's very human. I think that, you know, I think we, we get sunk when we um, and totally dispirited when we can't do some degree of mental trickery to sort of n figure out how we'll feel like things are going to be okay. And I'm, I'm interested in how we do that, how we negotiate that as individuals, but also, um, you know, whether or not we feel like we can, we have access to some sense of like community or, you know, social solidarity as in, in our negotiations of, of um, managing our anxieties or feeling like there's a, there's a future in our lives. I mean, it was interesting rewatching um, Inquiring Nuns, actually, because, you know, like, everybody says they're happy, right? You, and, and it's after they say they're happy that some, you know, uh -huh. the, then it gets more complicated. But at first glance, they get, most people get asked the question, are you happy? And they say yes. And so one basic Last woman, there's a one. Right, right. There's not right now. Right. Um, but yeah, I was just like, what? I didn't ask. I didn't ask that question in my film, but I I wondered if you made a film right now, would people still be so quick to say yes and then maybe but, um, or is there a kind of and what was that about? Like, were people generally more happy, or is it just the sort of culture um, of like public expression where you 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 don't feel you know in in the late sixties like you could admit that you're unhappy or uh, anyways, it was really interesting to revisit. And they're talking to nuns. I think that also <laughs> uh, made, you, you know, made a difference of how people begin. And then you kind of see the arc of the interview or conversation as it goes on, that people dig deeper and deeper. One of the things I'm always struck by, uh, and it, I, we didn't quite see it at the time because the war in Vietnam was on all of our minds. But when you look at it now, you know, back, it's like, oh, my God, everybody's thinking about the war. And, it, it, you know, right. history gives you a different lens on some of those things that you've lived through. What was striking about that to me is, yeah, almost everyone says they would be happier if the situation in Vietnam were resolved. Um, in, you know, it's traditionally taught as a, the anti-war sentiment as an aspect of counterculture. But it seems like it was pretty well part of <laughs> mainstream culture, that sentiment. Was that something that you were looking to tackle going in or just, that just emerged as, as a portion of the time? It, it really just emerged because uh, we went in very open-ended. You know, we, we loved the question from Chronicle of the Summer. We thought it, 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 it's sort of similar to what Brett was saying, that when you, when you ask people an open-ended question, when you ask them a question where there's not, it's not a political question, they're not taking a stand on anything, that has the potential then of peeling the onion and getting down lower to, to some other kinds of feelings. So, you know, we didn't, it wasn't on our minds, it was on the minds of the people we were talking to. Interesting. Um, I think it's interesting also that um, 
in, a lot of people say they're happy, but also a lot of the people you interviewed, it was on a Sunday, right? We're, we're experiencing leisure time yeah. in, in places where they wanted to be. We, we initially, the initial idea was we were going to do it all outside of churches and be talking to people coming out of church. But that started to have some limitations in terms of where the conversations went. And you see in the, the very last conversation, that series is inside the Art Institute. And we were thinking, that's a, like a good location for us because people are already, they're looking at art. They're probably inside their head. They're a little more solitary. Uh, and so we thought maybe, you know, we, we, we realized that there was a, a superficiality to what we were getting in front of the churches. So we started to change some of the locations. And then Mark, your film paints a, a contrast to that in that um, you chose to deal explicitly with labor. Uh, what motivated that decision to interview workers? I guess it's similar um, to what uh, Gordon and Brett were saying about um, open-ended questions. You know, I just, um, you know, everybody's got something to say about their relationship to labor. And um, it sort of started with a dinner table conversation uh, asking people, you can ask anyone what their weirdest job was. And everybody's got something to say about, um, you know, a tale of misery or a strange firing or, you know, something that, um, you know, rendered the, them completely powerless or whatever. So, um, you know, similarly, I just thought, let me, let me focus on what people consider their work. And this will lead to other um, things that they say, and it will more, more importantly lead the audience to think about work that they see being done, work that they themselves do, what they consider their engagement with work itself is. Did you have a political interest in labor as well? Or um, w how did you choose the people you spoke to and, and what was sort of the underlying nature of that? I had a political interest in that, um, you know, I, I'm interested in the gig economy in a bad way. Uh, I'm interested in, um, you know, I, I started the film in Pittsburgh uh, because I felt like the automatic vehicle landscape there is a kind of, um, telling site for what's going on. It's this sort of unholy alliance between Carnegie Mellon, first military technology developed by Car Carnegie Mellon, uh, the city of Pittsburgh and Uber. So they're all, it's a sort of private public uh, educational consortium uh, meant to turn a Rust Belt city into something quote green, you know, which is greener than burning fossil fuel, but obviously blue collar workers, the ones that are impacted by it. So I, I was very interested in politics. I, I interviewed the, the union people, the wobbly historian and things like that. Um, I found that if I kept my questions more neutral, more um, open-ended, um, the politics would seep through or rise to the surface and I could draw connections between a certain kind of gig worker and another gig worker and the audience could put them together um, in their mind. Um, so I sort of came at it from that viewpoint but wanted the film to not expl explicitly state it. I think if we look at um, the original, the film was really made in Comic Called the Summer and then these ones, there's a very, you see very clearly uh, the decline in the power of, of unions and, and the labor movement generally. Um, and one thing that surfaces in, in both your film, Brett, and yours, Mark, is the automation um, that also came, comes up in, in those um, earlier films. Uh, with, in, your, in the case of Work Songs, it was, uh, it's about self-driving cars. Uh, and in the hottest August, we have, um, somebody talking very enthusiastically about what they call robot communism. Uh, they're optimistic about the idea that people no longer have to work and perhaps that will give us the ability to actually care for people. Um, do you see uh, automation as, as one of the, the large forces uh, that'll drive you know, the world we see going forward? Both, both Mark and Brett and even Gordon, if you have thoughts on the subject. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, we're seeing it in this, in this moment um, now, you know, with Amazon take, you know, Amazon has, has increased its profile. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, in my film, it was also the UPS driver, you know, fewer and fewer people 
they're hiring fewer and fewer people. People, um, they're sort of um, can, tethered to the company in terms of their smart devices. Um, there's no, there's no. Um, uh, a UPS driver can't decide how he or she wants to drive from here to there. It's all mapped out. Um, and things like that. And, uh, you know, Ken Loach's latest film, Sorry We Missed You, deals with that very directly. And it reminded me of this guy I interviewed, the UPS guy who said, you know, he had to do 16 stops an hour or they tried to fire him when he sank to 15.99 stops an hour. So. Yeah, and I don't think you can really separate automation from from capitalism, right? Which is to say the drive to profit. And what we have going on is technology evolves is that you have technology, the, the people that are con in control of how technology evolves um, are those um, who are the most invested in re you know, recouping profit um, at the expense of workers. So, you know, I, I'm sort of agnostic on the question of automation or technology per se, but I'm not agnostic on you know, the palpable sense that we all, we, we can see all around us, and certainly we're seeing in the COVID crisis, that, um, that workers have less power, that, um, that the, the gig economy, that deunionization, that the threat of automation, the threat, like the threat of globalization, is, is wielded to undermine um, the capacity of workers to feel like they have any kind of leverage. They can ever say no, they can ever not go into work when they're feeling sick. Um, and so that's the, that's the real threat. And it was sort of, you know, I, you, when that guy in my film says, you know, robot communism is the future, it's not even that I have an opinion on robots. It's more that like his sense that like, it's up to us to take back the possibilities of this technology and and use the technology to like reconfigure society the, the 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 rules of how society is organized that was what and his enthusiasm over it was um what was uh you know most delightful to me listening right yeah he saw optimi he was optimistic about something most people uh are pretty scared about um as was as was the um economist who uh proposed taking capitalism into overdrive and commodifying air, uh, which yeah, I found. I mean, he's, he's a hedge fund manager who has made his money, in his words, you know, um, finding value, like uh, capital value in previously unvalued things. So, um, you know, he's got, he's making a lot of money in the charter school movement and like uh, investing in governments and guesting in, investing in other things that previously have been uncapitalized. And I, I you know, him, you look at something like air that was once free and you see something that can be be valued from a financial point of view. And I think what's, again, what's most interesting to me is the, is the sort of way in which the mind, uh, this is true of all of us, you know, myself included, the way in which we narrativize things to make them, um, to make them feel like they are, uh, the, the, they're legitimate. So, you know, he's, he's not saying like, yay me, I'm going to make a lot of money by privatizing air. He's saying there's a social good if we attach a number to these, these things. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's up to the viewer to decide how they, how they feel about what he, he's saying in the context of all the other kinds of scarcity we're encountering. I, right. I, I have to see your new movie, which I haven't seen. Uh, when I was in high school, and I think it was maybe 10th grade because I think it was biology. I was ahead of my time. I, we were all supposed to do a project and I came up with the idea of in a sense privatizing air. And I came into the class with a refrigerator box, the box that the refrigerator comes in strapped to my back to demonstrate how this would work and everybody would be wearing one of these, one of these things. And it was you know, dealing with pollution and air pollution and all of that. And it was, the teacher didn't think it was so great, but the class was really cracked up. Uh, but I think it all does come back to what Brett was saying before, that power relationships are so important. And in our own work, we, our early films, which are sort of pure verite in many ways, the, I, we thought if you hold a mirror up to society, it will see its flaws and it will, you know, and that will create a certain kind of social change. 
and we did a lot of labor films uh, in the uh, in the early seventies, uh, and they all landed in defeat. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, you'll see a film like The Last Pullman Car. They they have a verite through line, but they have a driving narration, an analytical construct where we're really talking to the audience about power relationships and trying to say these people are in a hopeless struggle because the power relationships are so unequal. And that when people are engaged in those struggles, they have to understand what they are up against if they have a, a, a chance of winning. Uh, we're not making films like that anymore, but I think in my mind, I'm always thinking about where the power lies and what's going on. Uh, I think Brett is right. It's like more jobs have been lost to automation than to off offshoring. But the reality is the problem is who controls the automation, who controls it, who sets, a, I mean, look at Jeff Bezos, he's just made 30 billion more or whatever it is. And he, don't, he wants to take away the $2 an hour that his warehouse workers are making. And their industry still needs workers. They're just paying them half what they paid them 15, 20 years ago. Uh, wow. But they, 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 you know, a lot of these new, like the gig economy, it's like they still need these workers, they just don't wanna pay them. We're starting to get some questions from the audience, so um, I'll pivot to those. Um, I have a question from Jen Reeves for Mark. What struck me is how fully you show and explore the environments the various workers inhabit as a nonverbal way of letting us into their experience. Can you talk about your approach to this? Um, yeah, I mean, I. I uh... I, I sort of divided each shoot into two, um, you know, two uh, sections. And one was the interview and whatever came out of the interview. And then the other was the environment. And I would, you know, almost, you know, change shirts or something between, between these two shoot, shoots. So, uh, for instance, on the farm, which closes out the film, you know, I interviewed the, the um, farmer, um, Joel Salatin, from uh, Polyface Farms in, in Virginia, and um, just kept his words in my mind, and then spent another two days by myself on the farm, you know, looking at these processes and trying to to create a backdrop and create an inter interplay between his words and you know what was going on there. And in San Pedro, California, the longshoreman I interviewed. Um, uh, you know, again, I, I spent even more time, about a week with the crew and alone, um, you know, trying to get, trying to, to sort of uncover the process of, you know, taking something off a ship, you know, putting on a, on a uh, rail cart, uh, unpacking a ship, loading a ship and all those things. So almost two, two different um, ways of looking at it. One involving words and experiences and anecdotes and the other, this sort of visual, um, almost balletic, world of work. Um, here's a question for everyone, really, uh, and I think a, a super important one. Um, how do you approach editing a work that lacks a traditional structure and is meandering by nature? Um, maybe, Brett, do you want to talk about how you, how you structured your film? Sure, I'll try. I mean, it's very hard and, and it's, there's, um, it's as difficult to describe as it was to do, um, precisely because as he is, you know, the the um, person who asked the question suggests there's no, you know, there's no, um, there's no plot points to follow. There's no um, obvious arc. Um, and even in our case, we could have considered the chrono chronology of the month um, as a structuring device, but we decided not to. And so we kind of treated the, treated the edit, and I worked with an editor named Nels Banger. We try, we sort of treated it as itself an experiment um, in the same way that, the, the mode of making the film was. Um, and his sort of answer to that experiment was to say, hey, I mean, the, you've given me 100 hours of footage. You've, we've talked about the sort of themes and questions that we're interested in. Um, it could be anything. Um, why don't we just start by making something? And he basically, you know, cut a two hour film in the first month. And then we spent the next 11 months changing that film and, and ending up where we ended up. Um, 
And so, you know, I guess we were, we were trying to figure out things like, you know, I think, um, Mark, you used the term sort of accumulation, like how can you, how can you build momentum through like sheer accumulation and use the kind of like the magic of the edit um, to create interesting juxtapositions and rhymes and things that could happen by placing two things together or two things apart. So it was a lot of that sort of figuring, you know, finding like these, these small echoes between things that people would say, like the guy who leans out his window at the beginning of the film and says, you can do three things when you, when you, uh, grow up, go join the military, go to college or get a job. And then some other guy later in the film and later in the filming leans out his truck window and says the same thing. So to looking for moments like that, that could speak back to each other, moments that could um, say something else by virtue of the fact that they were put together um, so that you get this sense of a kind of like onion unfolding. Um, I mean, the metaphor that I sort of used in the edit room was like, I had this image of a Bruegel um, uh, painting turned into a thousand piece uh, uh, jigsaw puzzle and we were just putting all the pieces together until gradually a picture emerges um, but but the truth is that you know those pieces could have been arranged in lots and lots of different ways and maybe you know maybe there's a totally different but just as interesting of a film that might have been made if we'd structured it differently. Gordon do you have a, a method of approaching um, well structure? you know it, it changes over time and so I would say that most of our films now, we spend about a year or sometimes two years in the editing process. But The Inquiring Nuns was a real contrast. Uh, there were a lot of budget constraints. We're editing film. And I edited it not in chronological order exactly, but the locations are in the order that we shot them. In a couple of cases for the kind of thing that Brett was talking about, I'm, you know, the way that something resonated with something else, I maybe moved within that an interview around. And within the interviews, I'm also really kind of, they have an arc that was what happened between the people. So in a sense, I'm preserving that timeline. I'm not moving it like sometimes when we do stuff, we move stuff all over the place and create a much more complicated uh, edit, but I was sort of editing things in that same, you know, in the, in, the, in the order in which the interview was given. The other thing that was unusual was that we, we probably had a shooting ratio of maybe four to one, you know. Uh, almost everyone we talked to was in the film. Uh, virtually everyone gave us a release, which we always asked for after it happened. But you can actually see it in the film. Sometimes we're walking up to people and they just start talking to them. Uh, and, you know, it was, I don't know, it was, it, 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 we, I think we had, there were some benefits to that, but I can't say we work that way now. Our editing process is uh, much more uh, what Brett was describing, incredibly complicated and, uh, you know, trying a lot of different things in terms of finding the story within the material. Is four to one a pretty standard ratio um, for, oh, no. for uh, footage to no. editing? No, we, we, you know, it's more like, even Home for Life, our first film, you know, I think our ratio was, because that was a more pure verite film, the ratio was probably 20 to 25, uh, you know, but now sometimes we're, you know, it could be 80 to one. We shoot an enormous amount of material relative to what ends up on the screen. And How many hours? You, oh, you know, sorry. Now that you're now that you're talking digital, you know, I mean, right. I, I forgot the number from Hoop Dreams, but it's it's enormous. Um, Mark and Brett, how many hours do you think you shot? I'm I'm bad with math. Um, I think um, six, seven to one, something like that. I don't know. No, it was way more than that. What am I talking about? Yeah. Twenty to one. I failed math, what can I tell you? Well, we live at a digital age now. The, the economics are very different. When you're shooting film, you know, it's very expensive. And we were just starting out. So we were on very tight budgets, you know, and I was very conscious of like the cost of every second that's going by. Uh, it's very different now. 
Yeah, we shot um, approximately 110 hours, which actually felt very, con con you know, contained. Um, it was limited by the fact that we, you know, we shot entirely over the course of one month, give or take a couple days. Um, so, so there was wasn't going to be any more shooting after the month is, was over, which kept the ratio, you know, relatively manageable. Um, but that's still a lot of footage. In terms of structure. Um just to answer Alex's question for work songs um, and happy actually one thing that I find um, useful in um, in sort of being as free as Le Jolie May and the Chronicle are in terms of digressions and meandering in the editing is to sort of um, throw away the distinction between pre-production production and post-production and um, I'm always editing as I shoot uh, when I went out to California, I even did some edits at night in the immediate. Um, and I'm, I'm always sort of, you know, shooting a little bit, finessing it, deciding I, uh, there's a hole in there, deciding to shoot something else. And then at the end, I was shuffling things around completely. I had all these interviews. I worked with two editors, Sarah Jacobson and Tim Sternberg. And they each, you know, tried grouping certain things together, emphasizing types of labor, emphasizing types of personalities, job satisfaction. There are all these variables and we just tried to keep, you know, shuffling the deck and not having a set length in mind. Or, I mean, at one point I thought it could be a 20 minute film and another time I thought it could be a three part series. And I think, you know, being open to whatever it ends up to be is um, one of the benefits of um, not being beholden to you know, the feature film paradigm or anything like that for me. Um, I have another question here from Elijah S. When speaking to people on the street, people often say things that contradict their material conditions, uh, whether that's saying they love their job or that they aren't worried about climate change, uh, you know, when that might not be the case or that they're completely happy with their lives, etc. How do you navigate that and its relationship to your own politics in the conversation, in the conversations while filming and in the editing process of the constructing uh, of the film. And I guess I'll add, do you even see that as, as your role at all? Um, if anybody wants to answer that one. Um, I mean, I think I'll say, I'll start out by saying like, I, I think that's also one of the remarkable things about La Jolie May is just the sort of deep delight and respect that, um, Chris Marker and Pierre Lohm have for their subjects. And it really comes through, you know, the, the, this is a film with a point of view, um, but the, the point of view does not subsume um, these encounters. The people are allowed to exist on their own terms um, and they have dignity um, for, for that. Um, I, you know, I sort of think about all people in all of my projects as, as um as as you know both experts of their own lives and also as unreliable narrators um because because we we are i mean we have we're all that's available to us to make sense of our lives is the stuff of our lives and then also like the messages we get from the universe so those are the terms that we're given to then do this really hard work of making sense of really challenging things to make sense of. We have the, we have limited views. So um, I guess I just sort of try to approach people like that. I, 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 I take them seriously, um, but I also try and use the language of film to provide context um, so that an audience member can come to their own sort of uh, opinion on the, what it means that someone is describing their life in certain terms. Um, somebody asked a similar question, um, and to add to it a little bit, regarding the influence of the camera on people's answers, in what way do you account for that, uh, try to avoid it, or allow it to be included? Um, I will note that at the end of, for those who've seen it, at the end of um, Chronicle of the Summer, the sh subjects of the film are shown the film so that they can comment on it, um, and pretty hilariously, a lot of them dismiss it as being phony um, or else indecent. Um, they, if somebody does comment that they feel the, camp, the presence of the camera makes it impossible uh, to be truthful and genuine, um, how do you all feel about that? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, that 
of course, I mean, it, we don't work with a hidden camera. The camera's there and we're transparent about that. I think in inquiring nuns, we actually include in our conversations with the, the nuns, the two conversations that take care, place in the car, we're talking about that very issue of how do you actually find out what's on people's minds? How do you get deeper into the conversation? Of course, they start superficially and they talk about what they've learned over the course of doing all these interviews. Um, I, I think probably in our case, the fact that the, the questioners were nuns had more to do with what influenced the people's answers than the fact that the camera was there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think today, we, we live in, a, in, a, in the digital age and people are, you know, if, if you look back in the 1930s at people being interviewed on film, it suddenly becomes, there's a great big camera on sticks and they've seen it on TV. So they know how they're supposed to act. You know, they, I am a worker and I'm speaking, you know, it, it gets very formalized. And I think we've gone through generations of people becoming fairly used to being film to being on camera, whether it's in their home or on their phone or whatever. And yes, they may be hiding certain things, but I think, I, I, I think, you know, this idea that Brett expressed that they're the experts on their own lives and they're also unreliable narrators. And I think that's something that there, there are quite a few novels that are like that, you know, where you, you have a narrator or a, the, the storyteller and as you dig into it, you come to realize that this poor person is actually unreliable. Do you find that um, the explosion of visual technology over the years has made it easier to interview people? Have I they become know. more comfortable? I don't, not I'm necessarily. Not sure. I, I, yeah. I noticed the change between Happy, um, which was made in 2001, and, you know, the, the presence that a camera has in one's hand has changed. In, in one hand, um, people are filming all the time on their cell phones, so it's more, more ubiquitous. Um, on the other hand, people are more concerned about where, where it's going to go, what the, what the, end, of, what the you know, end of the chain is or whatever. Um, it, in my case, I, I sort of played with it. At one point, I had a cut where I revealed the crew as its own band of workers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also had the, the kind of um, freedom to move back and forth between being a single person on the street with the camera and sort of approaching people in the immediate unprepared and sitting people down and lighting them and setting it up and doing a clapboard and all that. So I just tried to keep a lively mix between those, those two things. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to say one thing about the... Um, interviewing people with whom you might disagree. Um, I kept thinking of psychiatry when I was making this film and another film I made called Oil Towns about oil workers in North, uh, North uh, Dakota. And you know, you know how a shrink is quiet or, or allows someone to express themselves or just sort of a sounding board. And um, you know, I'm not a shrink, but, uh, but I sort of felt like people would say, particularly in oil towns, uh, people would say these sort of really, well, re really um, reactionary things. But I thought, well, I'm not here to, to disagree with them. Uh, I'm here to sort of let them um, express themselves and, and see what comes out of it in, in the service of the film. Um, another question. Uh, in this moment, filmmakers may be inclined to gauge the collective fears, anxieties, desires, politics of people uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the material conditions and safety measures of the crisis, however, preclude this method of in-person on the street dialogue. It's of course much uh, more fraught in approaching people now. Um, in the tradition of Marker and Rouge, and in line with your previous work, how would you approach a film that evokes and explores time and place right now? Is that something you've given any thought to? Again, for anyone. Well, I, I, you know, I was in the hospital and then in rehab and before all that happened, there was a group of former interns who were following me around, making a film about me. Uh, I was a little bit embarrassed by this, but they, they were quite tenacious. And they contacted me uh, in the hospital and they wanted to do an interview with me, I guess it was in rehab. 
and they had gotten, I had a camera there, so we did a Zoom call and they interviewed me, but I also set the camera up uh, so that it could be recorded. And then they wanted to come down. My wife was going to pick me up as I'm leaving and they wanted to film that, you know, and it was like, I really tried to discourage them in a sense. It's like, it's a not, it's a nothing scene, you know, you don't, you know, and it's, they, they're going out on the street. On the other hand, they're going out on it. it it's their project. I mean, I think that we have to be careful. There's some people who are working on some guidelines about, you know, how to think about filming in the time of COVID and that kind of thing. And I think coming from a union perspective, I'm in the DGA and I was in uh, the camera union for many years. I think there's a lot to think about in terms of the power relationship. When you're working with someone or the people working for someone else, there's a whole set of questions that come into being. But if you've got young independent people who are sort of setting their own rules and setting their own parameters, those aren't always the, the right questions. So I think that these ethical questions of filming in the time of COVID are figuring out what are the right contradictions that we're confronting. There will always be contradictions. There will always be figuring out what's the balance between two conflicting, you know, safety and getting the story. And we're, we're in a risky business, you know, which I said to a lawyer of ours once who was trying to say, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. There are all these risks. And I was like, no, no, no. What I want you to do is explain to me what the risks are and you need to understand our business is taking risks. We need to figure out the balance between the risk and what we're trying to do. So I think to me, it's figuring out what, what are the contradictions? I thinking about the current moment, I couldn't help but laugh when the young woman in work songs, Mark, uh, mentions that she wishes she could work from home all the time. Um, I wonder if you've spoken to her <laughs> since. I haven't, you know, she was someone, I mean, you know, it's always great when people surprise you in their film, right? And um, she was someone that I had professional contact with and I couldn't get to her, I couldn't find her office. And then I realized she didn't have an office because she was always working from home. And I thought, this is weird, you know? And then the other surprise was I, you know, sort of, I guess, part of me wanted her to say how alienating that was and how much she missed the community, but in fact, she loved working from home and wished she could work from home all the time, as you say. I haven't spoken to her. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I, I, um, my practice is a lot based on New York City density and travel, neither of which are really there. So I'm thinking about a road film of some kind. Um, and I'm interested in this paradigm right here. Uh, you know, maybe throwing out questions to people to have them answer in their own solitude or something. I haven't thought that through. I may not do it, but I think it's interesting. I've made diary films myself. And I think if this is, if this is our new frame, I'm willing to explore it in some way that I haven't fully thought out yet. Can I ask a question of, uh, of, of all of you? I'm wondering if anyone knows the story of the relationship between Chronicle of the, of the Summer and La Jolie May. Like, why was La Jolie May made? How, how, in what way was it a response to Chronicle of the Summer? Does anyone know? Uh, I do, I feel uh, deeply embarrassed that I do not know. <laughs> I feel as a curator, I should know that. Um, but I actually don't. I don't know what the relationship between Chris Marker and, and Jean Rouge was. Um, I mean, I know Chris, Chris Marker and Pierre Lum, you know, had had watched that film and were are they are responding to it. Um, and but I but I yeah, that's it's they, they, yeah, they they knew each other. But I think and you see it in, in Chronicle of a Summer and, you know, in some ways you're seeing a little bit of that in Inquiring Nuns, too. It's like uh, Maureen and, and Roosh are coming from this more academic kind of context and you, you see them as characters in their own film and, and talking about the experiment and kind of unfolding all of that. And I think Marker always saw himself more as an artist. And I, I felt Marker too was, was more, was really trying to make an explicit um, political statement. You know, the final words of that film are as long as there are prisons, 
uh, you are not free, which I'm sure resonates with you, Brett, especially as-, as Oh, I mean that, interestingly enough, the last scene of that film inspired the last scene of my previous film, The Prison in 12 Landscapes, which is premised on the idea that you'll never see a prison in the whole film. And then I watched La Jolie May, which is not a film about prisons, but it ends with a prison. And right. that's what gave me the idea to end uh, pr The Prison in 12 Landscapes with a shot of Attica. Yeah. Which is also an extraordinary film um, that you all should see if you haven't. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll uh, wrap things up with this question um, for all of you, starting with Gordon. Uh, are you happy? I, I uh, having made that film and it was re-released, you know, so I was traveling with it again. And I, I've been asked that a lot. And I don't really have an answer. I mean, it's like, yeah, I get to do the thing that I dreamed of doing in college. You know, I've had a, uh, in, in a sense, my work. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's Mark, you also capture that in, in your film that work can be a deep seated source of, of happiness and meaning in people's lives. And that's why they fight so hard uh, to hang on to it, uh, even when the work is sometimes alienating. Um, so, you know, I, I uh, I've never had a good answer for that. Oh, I'm certainly glad you're healthy. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I mean, basically I'm, and I wouldn't say happy, I'm amazed that I'm still alive. Mm. It's quite a journey. Brett? Yeah, I have the same difficulty. I really related to the, the person um, in Inquiring Nuns who says, I don't even know what that question means. What do you <laughs> Right, about? right. You know, the, the guy. Yeah. <laughs> Just to, to reveal a bit of, you know, I mean, it's pretty clear. That's both the cameraman, who is me, and the editor creating this incredible intensity between the nun and the person that, you know, she's talking to. Mm. And it was happening, but it could have been shot and edited in, in a very different way to, to have missed it. Mm. Um, he was so taken with that guy. Mm. And by the way, on the DVD, uh, there are interviews with the nuns 40, 45 years later. Of course, neither one of them are nuns. Uh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I, tra I tracked them down and, and you can see them in, you know, all these years later. Yeah. Yeah, I think very briefly, my answer is sort of, it's, it's a similar answer to I, the one I give when people ask how I feel about the future. Um, which is the film I, the question I ask in my film, um, which is like, you know, I, I still have a will to keep going <laughs> and to um, try and join up with other people to make things better. Um, and that's, that's a, that, that energy is a, is a kind of happiness. Mark? Well, for someone who, asks people on camera if they're happy. As Gordon says, I, um, I find it oddly dissonant with me as well. Um, I've always thought it was weird that, you know, the pursuit of happiness is like written into this country's, um, yes. you know, ethos really right there in black and white. Um, it strikes me as kind of irrelevant um, in some ways. It's like I have a sort of, uh, I don't have Eastern European background, but I have a sort of fatalist uh, view towards life. So my standards are very, very low. And I would say that, uh, again, echoing what Gordon said, when I'm working on a project, I forget about larger uh, cosmic questions or, um, you know, evaluative questions about who I am or where I stand in the world. And that takes, that takes over. Um, I can't always do that for some financial reasons and then some worldly reasons and things like that. But when I'm in a project, and I'm sort of watching its own inner logic reveal itself to me to the extent that it has an inner lo logic, I feel happy. Right. Sorry, I had to ask it. I knew you'd all cop out. The camera was turned around. How about you and Let's come on, let's hear it. Yeah. You know what? I will say in this moment, I am extraordinarily happy to be on this screen with three of my favorite filmmakers. So thank you all so much for joining the conversation. It's nice to be with you all. I love and the programming, love all the films. Yeah, keep coming to Maisel's. Uh, thank you everyone who tuned in. If you feel like donating, please head to our website and do that. 
Thank you to Adam Hyman in the chat for pointing out some of the overlap between uh, Chronicle and um, La Jolie May. And the films are still available till the end of the month. So if you haven't seen any of them, go have yourself a marathon. Oh, um, and we'll see you, uh, yeah, we'll see you next, next time around.